All right. Well, I want to make sure that I am using this time the most efficiently for you. So let's start out by, do you want to talk more about like PA nuts and bolts, like actually putting, you know, terms into a PA and what they look like? Do you want to talk about negotiations and how those conversations look? Um, feel free to kind of throw out what questions you have, or I can just kind of dive in. I think what we were talking about in our class, and if anybody has anything, oh, Ashley, go ahead, sorry. Oh, I was just gonna say all of the above. <laughs> deal, 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 deal. Okay, so I'm gonna ask a question. If you don't know the answer, that is totally okay. What makes a clean offer? Because I'm sure, have you heard the term clean offer before? What, what makes for a clean offer? No contingencies, maybe? Okay. Yeah, who said that? Splinter, nice. Splinter, yeah. Yep. So a clean offer is gonna be what's the most competitive offer for the moment, presented in the best light possible for your buyers, basically. So starting off, first things first is gonna be communication, 100,000%. So typically what I say is when it comes to negotiations, you start negotiating the second you show that house or the second you, you initiate any interaction with that listing agent. So you want to be on your best behavior all the time, especially in a market like this. If the market, if the roles were reversed, maybe you could, you know, be a little sassy, like some of those listing agents you've probably interacted with. Um, but being on the buyer side of things, one of the best ways to make sure that you're putting your buyer in the best light possible is to make sure that you maintain the best reputation possible with that listing agent. So what does that look like? When you're first showing the home, you know, you can call the agent ahead of time, find out, this might save you time too, Call the listing agent ahead of time, find out where they're at, if they have offers, if they have a deadline, um, what's a good closing date for the seller. If you come to the showing with that information, I think you're going to save yourself some time and you're going to, it's going to look like a badass to your buyers because you're going to look like you already have all the information ready to go if they so choose to write on it. Then once you show them the home, feedback is crucial. So whether you're submitting feedback through showing time, which I recommend, um, honestly, in this market, when homes fly off the shelves within 48 hours, it's not, I actually don't always get to the showing time feedback. And I don't even know if the sellers are looking at it at that point. Um, but I make sure to touch base with the listing agent in any case, if it's something that my buyers aren't interested in showing time feedback is great. Don't be rude on there either. There's no reason to ever be rude and giving feedback. Doesn't matter if the house isn't up to your standards, if it's messy whatever, there's sellers looking at that. Again, your reputa reputation precedes you in every single conversation. On the other flip side, if your client really likes the house, that's when you go into negotiation mode. That's when you go into star agent mode. So they like the house, they're thinking about, they wanna make an offer. First things first, you're gonna call that listing agent and you're gonna just introduce yourself. You're going to build rapport. The biggest, biggest, biggest thing, I cannot stress this enough, is become best friends with the listing agent. Because I can tell you so many times where we were not the best offer on the table, but my level of communication and my level of just consistency with the listing agent already makes it look like it's gonna be a smooth transaction. So how do you win the listing agent? Typically what I say when I start those conversations is, I mean, it depends on your personality. So you're really gonna wanna make sure that you're staying true to yourself but try and make that listing agent see you as a human, as crazy as that sounds. So what, what that means for me is I try and make them laugh somehow. I jump in a little joke or I'm like, thank you so much for taking my call. I'm sure you've had, you know, a hundred calls today. You know, something that simple. And they'll be like, oh my God, you have no idea. And at that point you can already feel them because typically when you're calling a listing agent, they're like on it because they're receiving a million calls a day. You want to make sure that they're not in autopilot mode when they're speaking with you. So whatever it is, whether it's uh, the weather is so nice, are you able to get outside today? Or some get them off the track of the property. The second you can engage them or find some commonality outside of the property itself, you're gonna start to Thanks. Okay, so where was I? So when we're asking um, the listing agent what the seller needs. So you can ask the basic questions, which are what's a good closing date for your seller every single time. 
every single time. Sometimes more often now they're putting it in the MLS because they're receiving hundreds of calls. But in any case, I would ask even still if it's listed in, you know, April 30th is preferred closing date. Here, like this is huge, especially right now, write this down. Would your sellers like a rent back or would your sellers like to close sooner and rent back so that they can have time to look for a property. I'm liking this validation, Delena. You're like, yeah. <laughs> um, that is something that we can get into what the specifics of that look like. If we have time here at the end, or you're welcome to reach out to me anytime. Um, but basically what a rent back means is the seller of the property that you're trying to make an offer on has to buy contingent, meaning they have to sell their home before they can purchase another home. We know, I mean, maybe you don't know yet if you're new to this, but a contingent offer in this market is, is really tough. It's really hard to get accepted because there's so many other, the competition's so high that there's the likelihood of someone else being non-contingent is way up there. So what does that do for the listing agent and for the sellers? Number one, that shows that you're already ready to negotiate. You're willing to work with them and you're flexible. You and your buyers are flexible. That's great. Even if they don't need a rent back, you're already saying, you're already putting out there, hey, we're flexible. We really want to work with you in order to get this done. Now, if they do want to rent back, again, we'll get into the specifics of that a little bit later, but that basically means that you close on the house, you rent it back to the sellers. They have the opportunity to purchase non-contingent at that time. Great for your people who are in month to month leases, living with family, um, or don't have a home to sell before they move. Next question, is that closing date, I mean, if, if you want to, is that closing date flexible or would it be better if it were longer? Because some people are saying April 30th because that's what they think that we want or that's what they think you know we need to do. I always ask, I always say dig three deep on every single question, you know, because it might be that they're closing on their new construction house at that on that day. The more information you can find out about the sellers and their situation, the better. So just keep asking questions. And then um, I always say too, this is a, a question that's absolutely useless. It makes no sense really, but I ask it every single time and you would be so surprised the good feedback that I get from it. So I always ask, is there anything else I need to know in order to make this the cleanest offer possible for you and your sellers? And I just am silent. They usually don't know how to answer it right away. I feel like, well, uh, uh, because how do you answer that? There's no real way. But a lot of listing agents are very rigid in what they're going to disclose to you as they should be per their fiduciary responsibility, right? There's only so many things that they can, they can legally disclose. But the more rapport you build, the more apt they are to be friendly with you as a person and start to reveal some stuff. And again, you are the fiduciary for your client as well. It is up to you to try and put their offer in the best light possible. So ask away. If a listing agent is willing to disclose things to you, that's on them. So every once in a while, they'll tell you things like, oh yeah, they already bought a house in Florida and they're not even living there anymore and they really need to go and they actually really like the color purple. Everything they tell you about that seller can be, you know, basically can be super useful in a negotiation situation. So can I ask you a question? Please. What are they, what are the listing agents not allowed to disclose? I think that's where I get so confused on what you can ask because, you know, since we're so new, it's like, we're, we're being told, keep everything confidential. And then we're learning, you got to ask this or that. So I just don't know what, what are they not supposed to do? Maureen, you can ask anything. Make sure- They just you can't know. answer. <laughs> you can ask anything. What they cannot share is price, terms, and motivation. Okay. So what that means is they can't disclose the offers that they have on the table currently they can't disclose that it is three hundred fifteen thousand dollars is what I have on the table. In order to beat this, you're gonna have to, you know, go for three twenty or something like that. You know how you can get around that though, and how I've successfully done it is, you know, I don't know. Basically, you say, so you know, my buyers are at X. We're kind of stretching at this point, you know, where I don't, I'm not exactly sure if we're gonna be able to compete if there's twenty offers on the table. Typically they're like, oh, there's not 20 yet. There's only five. Okay. All right. It's good for me to know. I'm starting to like do some calculations in my head based on what I know. Okay. It could be about 10, $15,000 offer over, excuse me. 
Um, and then I asked the question, it's, it's all about asking very vague questions kind of around the actual point um, and asking clarifying questions. So, okay, so I, you know, I know where my, what my buyers can do and I know you've got five offers on the table already. Uh, you think, you know, you think 330 would get it done? And that's, if they say yes to that, they are not disclosing what they have on the table. Because I mean, if they have a 305, 330 sure as hell will get it done, right? They're not disclosing what they have, but they're letting you know that kind of in a vague sense where you're standing amongst the competition. Um, then I ask, I also ask what other, I mean, what other offers in terms of like, would it be helpful or are there, are there other offers on the table that are waiving an inspection? I ask straight up. And every once in a while, you'll get someone who's really salty and really sassy. He's like, I'm not going to disclose that to you. Okay, I want to back up really quickly. You are going to run into listing agents who have something stuck up there, you know, where, and they're super, super cocky because they're a listing agent in a market and they know that they have the commodity that you want. Your girl is Puerto Rican and she's fiery, okay? It takes a lot to not get sassy back quite often, but it's worth it every single time. So anytime someone gets sassy with me, which they will, if you're asking the right questions and you're probing enough, some people might get a little frustrated with you and that is okay. You're not gonna, you're not gonna undo the deal if somebody gets frustrated with you. The best thing that you can do is not get frustrated back, not get fiery back. So don't be, don't be patronizing and be like, oh, why are you mad? But I was just saying, you know, I sincerely apologize. I, I was not trying to offend you. I'm not trying to, uh, you know, make you disclose something that you're not comfortable disclosing, but I just want to make sure I'm doing the best for my clients. I want to make sure that I'm putting them in the absolute best spot possible. You would do the same for your clients, wouldn't you? And they're always like, I mean, yeah. And then they start to, you can feel it. Like you can feel the energy shift on the phone. So it's all about asking questions and they're stressed, you know, like they're, they're getting a million calls a day. And so just making sure that you're the one that's in control of the conversation at any given time is important. And the person who's in control of the conversation is the person that's asking the questions because you get to direct how the conversation is going to go. And now all of that is, is kind of vague, just like conversational stuff. Happy to script with any of you anytime. Scripting is like the best thing you could do for yourself. I know it's uncomfy and scary at first, but meet a listing agent, ask a listing agent in your office or in other, other KW offices, like, Hey, I see that you're a listing agent. Would you spend 10 minutes on the phone with me? You'd be surprised how many people say yes. And, and just say, you know, if I asked you this question, how would you respond? And, and you can kind of just test it back and forth before you're actually in, in the game, you know? Um, but is there any questions you guys have about communication before I get into like the actual nuts and bolts of PA stuff? I, I still do with the price terms and motivation. So the price, there's a listing price, right? So you've got something to work with right off the bat. Yep. Um, when you're asking for closing date, isn't that considered terms or rent back? I mean, isn't that technically? They can't, I, sh I should say, they can't disclose the terms of the offers that they have in hand. Okay. Okay. But they can, but they can disclose to you anything that the seller says is okay. So okay. if the seller, they ask the seller, do you want me to share a closing date? You know, cause basically, or more often than okay. not, a seller is going to want to pick their closing date in a competitive okay. situation. Okay. So as long as the seller has said, yeah, I'll, you can tell them that I want to close April 30th. That's what they, they can share. Okay. And then motivation is why, why they wanted to sell in the first place. Yep. Where they're going, why they're going. Okay. okay. That's okay. all I needed clarification on. Motivation is the one that listing agents give up so often. And that's some darn good ammo. If you decide to write a letter, which letters, I'm not going to give you my personal opinion. Um, but I see why there's controversy around it. Uh, but I am also a buyer's agent and I am here to get my buyer's offer accepted. So if a seller is willing to look at an offer and my buyer wants to write a letter, or excuse me, if a seller's willing to look at a letter, my buyer wants to write a letter, heck yeah, we're going to go for it. Make sure though that you're asking the listing agent. Now, I just had, I just did my code of ethics for this year. And a listing agent has to has to present everything that you present them. That said though, in an offer. So if you send a letter separately from your offer, they don't necessarily have to put it in because it's not a part of the paperwork, but they can't splice, pick and choose certain pages of offers to put in. So what that means is put
put everything in one PDF. Number one thing of a clean offer, one document every single time. It's pretty easy to do while you're signing. If you're getting different things signed at different times for different reasons, or your pre-approval letter hasn't come in yet. Here, I'll type it here. There's a lot of like PDF manipulating websites that um, like give you like free for five, five documents and you have to pay after that. That one I use all the time, split documents, merge documents, super, it's free, it's easy. Um, okay, order of events. Are you guys familiar with the order of what an offer should look like? Like what should be first, what should come next, all that? Okay, so this would be good to note then too. First things first, you are going to want to, basically you wanna prove that your buyer is legit before they even see the offer. So what that means is typically number one, if the uh, listing agent has an offer summary sheet, I like to put that first because it goes, it just, again, is, is putting you in the best light. Like, Hey, I saw that you had an offer summary sheet. I know that this is important to you. It's very important to me as well. So that's why I put it on top of the pile. I have a question. Next, I would do your personal letter. Cause again, I want them, I want, I want to pull on their heartstrings before they see those numbers. Cause sometimes numbers don't always do it for you, but if you get the heartstrings going, I mean, I don't know if you've heard this before, but it's logic makes you think and emotion makes you act. And so sometimes it, I, we've definitely had it where those letters are more important than a number on the page for sure. After the personal letter, what's up, Zach? Um, have you, in your experience, um, given the controversy on personal letters, do you see a switch in attitude from a seller or a listing agent, um, given that you um, are, are giving them a letter from the buyer? Does that make sense, what I'm asking? I understand the question. Like, I don't know how to really answer this. So, you know, there, there's so much controversy on it because, you know, you don't want um, your, your, uh, your sellers to be discriminated against your buyers in any capacity, anything like that. Does it like throw off your relationship a little bit with the listing agent or does it typically not have an impact? Because I so, could see. Sorry, again, yeah, my, my MO is although a listing agent can't not include it if it's a part of the entire offer, listing agents are bullies quite often. And I, again, it's my job to win the listing agent, win the listing agent, win the offer. If they say we are not looking at letters, I'm not going to push it. Because I, again, it's just easier to stay in their good graces. And I know I can communicate pretty darn well what my buyers need. Um, and do you, how do you approach that? Is that when you're, you know, do you ask straight out? Like, are you guys taking letters? Yep. Okay. Are you, and I don't ask you, don't ask them. That doesn't matter what they want. Are right. your sellers open to reading letters from the seller or letters right. from the buyer? That's what I meant, yeah. Yep. And um, well, and, gosh, you'll get a lot of listing agents that no, I don't do that. Okay, I completely understand. I'm curious if you've had that conversation with your sellers. Would they be open to looking at a letter? And again, it kind of makes them think a little bit. Um, after that, you're going to ask, um, oh gosh, where did I just go? Oh, another thing you want to ask for is if they accept escalation clauses. That's another big one. Um, I know we're going to run out of time here. Can I ask you a question, Emily? So you're telling me that if I send a, a letter or any other document separate from the purchase agreement, they aren't um, obligated to present that to their seller? If it's not a document that's associated with the offer, like basically with the purchase agreement, they don't have to. Oh my gosh, I did not know that. So that's why it's in your, I mean, like a pre-approval letter, they're going to, I'm sure. Yeah. So that everybody knows, but but really they're obligated to share the purchase agreement. Sorry, well, I missed, what was the last thing that you said? Do you accept what? Escalation clauses. Thank you. I have a question, Emily, around the summary of the offer. Do you include that um, as part of the actual PDF or in your email or both generally? So only some listing agents have summary sheets which are annoying to fill out, but do it because again, you're there to be, be their best friend. Summarize your, here, let me, I can show you one. I did. How do you know if they have one or not? You'll see it on the supplements. 
and they'll usually write it in the uh, um, agent remarks. I also have an executive summary I got from the Pivot Shift Mastermind group that um, Sam Nyland, TL from out east, uses and says is phenomenal. So I can share that with you guys if you want one of your own to, to use, whether or not the agent had one. Oh, this offer summary sheet? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, it, you can do one on your own, but it's just adding more work for you. And especially if you're doing it on a deadline, I don't know if you need to add a summary sheet. Cause again, it's just another document for them to, to sift through. Um, okay. So here I'll share my screen with you. So here's my, I shouldn't, yeah, I don't know their names. So this is my offer. Here's agent. Thank the seller for, please thank the seller for allowing the buyer to view their home. And thank you. I always say attach this email to purchase agreement. And here are the terms. I make it a different color because I want them to see straight out of the gate what they're looking for. What my offer says. Purchase price, earnest money, loan type and percentage down. If their seller paid closing costs, closing date. I bold the terms that I think are the strongest for this buyer based on the conversations that I've had not contingent upon the sale of another home, three day inspection. So one of the stronger terms or one of the terms you're gonna be able to edit is your inspection. The shorter the inspection is gonna look a little bit better to the seller. So, okay, back up. <clears throat> Let's go, I wanna go down each one of these individually. Purchase price. Purchase price, there's a listing price. Very rarely these days is that actually what the home sells for. So purchase price is, you. it's gonna be one of the most important, you know, terms, obviously. Everyone's looking at the number. It is not always the most important term. So that's why this conversation that you're having with the listing agent is very important. So when you ask that question, is there anything else I need to know in order to make this the cleanest offer possible for you and your sellers? They might say, actually, yeah, like they're building new construction and they really need a closing date of June 30th. Would that be a possibility? That in that situation, a closing date, a super long closing date, may be a better option than a 10 grand difference in price. That does happen. So that's why asking that question is super important. Then you're going to want to ask clarifying questions about what they have on the table, how many offers they have on the table, and then asking questions around the price without, I mean, you can ask them straight up, like, this is what, this is what we're thinking of, will that get it done? And I, I hesitate to give too many ideas about questions to ask here only because it is, it is going to be pretty specific to you, but just read, read the listing agent really well, ask whatever questions you feel comfortable with that aren't going to offend them. And, um, don't be scared to keep asking, keep asking because your first ask is typically going to be a no. It's probably going to be very vague. And then you build more rapport. You, you know, talk about the weather, whatever it might be wherever they're going up to the cabin this weekend. No, you got their report. Oh gosh. Well, this is just such a tough market. I want to go to the cabin next weekend. So just so I, you know, just so I can make sure I'm getting up to the cabin this weekend, would 243 get it done? Whatever that might be. And they might say yes, no, or the other thing, or they might laugh at you and be like, I know what you're trying to do. And you're not fooling me. At least they're laughing at you and they're not yelling at you. Um, and again, finding something to, to make yourself stand out. Next would be earnest money. Earnest money is typically anywhere from one to 3% of the purchase price. It's gonna be dependent on what your uh, buyer has liquid and available. What I always say to my buyers when asking about earnest money is, what do you feel comfortable putting down in earnest? It is due within two days of an offer being accepted. This is a part of your down payment, but I also wanna make sure we're not cleaning you out of house and home. This is more of a psychological number than anything, because whether you put down, you know, let's say their entire down payment is 15 grand, but whether they put down five grand down now and then 10, bring 10 grand to closing or one grand down at, in earnest and 14 grand to closing, it all comes out in the wash. It's the same thing. But the more you can put up in earnest upfront, the more serious you look. One thing you can do is make it non-refundable. That's one quick trick to basically say, we're here, we're serious. Even if we decide to cancel, you get to keep that money. 
that shows the seller that you are very serious about moving forward with this home. You have no intention of canceling. Another important thing about earnest money is when I say you don't clean yourself out of house and home, that money is going to be tied up until closing. So if, you know, if they, they put they have $5,000 in their savings account and they put all five down in earnest, are they going to be able to pay rent? You want to make sure you're asking those questions because there's, there's something to be said about putting your buyers in the best situation possible. And then there's empathy in knowing what they can do and where they're at without being too pushy. So whenever I ask this question, I say, you know, I know we're thinking about doing a $15,000 down payment. Is there, would it be comfortable for you to put that, that 10 grand or that 15 grand up today? Would you be able to still, you know, buy your groceries, pay your rent, things like that. And I'm just saying this, not because you have to do anything. I just want to make sure that I'm giving you all the options. You could always use that because they are going to start to feel like you maybe are pushing them a little bit. And as long as you just say like, I'm putting off, putting all the options on the table, it is up to you to decide. They're going to start to feel a lot better. You're also going to want to ask the, the listing agent, um, you know, would making that earnest money non-refundable be helpful? Just ask anything you want. And you're honestly, like when I was newer too, you're more than welcome to be like, hey, like I'm relatively new to the game here and I just wanna make sure that I'm doing the best job. Like the more, uh, what am I trying to say? Just like humble you are in asking these questions, the more apt they are to work with you and just, and help you out, you know? Okay, yeah, I've only written like three purchase agreements, but I know that these guys wanna do, you know, $6,000 in earnest money. How does that, how would that feel for you? Or what do you think about that? They're gonna probably be pretty warm to that. There's so many agents out there who are so cocky, who are gonna be like, I've been doing this for 30 years and let me teach you a thing or two. And then you're like, oh, okay, they teach me. And then they tell you everything that you need in order to get the house. So humility is huge, asking questions. Don't act like you know anything backwards and forwards. I would say that's, that's another thing. Like the more questions you can ask, the more information you're gonna gain. Even if you know, you know even if you made hundreds of offers before. All right, percentage down and loan type. So percentage down is, uh, you're gonna chat with the lender about that. When it comes to lending, you're gonna want your buyers working with a lender that you trust. And when I say you trust, it means that you've had a conversation with that lender. You know that they're gonna be working the same hours that you're working. And I always bring that up in my buyer consultation. If they come to me with a lender, I ask them to have a conversation with my lender. Why? Because I wanna make sure that you're working with somebody that's gonna work just as hard as I am in order to get this house for you. What does that mean? We're gonna be making offers, evenings, weekends, things like that. And honestly, in this market, lenders are kind of negotiating with us. I won an offer this weekend because only my lender reached out to the listing agent. And we were a significantly lower percentage down we're significantly lower in a few things. And the sellers felt confident in my lender because he had reached out and said that these buyers are, are solid. Jobs are solid. They're not going anywhere. They're definitely going to get to closing. That's huge in this market because there's a, again, there's just a ton of pre-approval letters floating around. The more people you can get, the more, the better memory you can make about your clients, their situation, the better you're going to spot you're going to be in. Um, conventional versus FHA versus DVA versus, is that it? Yeah, uh, cash is king. I mean, we know that, unfortunately, but 20% down conventional is really not that much different in the, in the whole scheme of things. Yes, there is gonna be an appraisal, but again, it's, it's kind of up to how you sell it to the listing agent. So if you've got a 10% down conventional person, it's not gonna look as good on paper to the person who's 20% down conventional it's a little bit riskier. So that's when your lender needs to step the heck up and vouch for them, for you. And you can too, you know, I know these guys have great jobs that are totally solid. It's a lot of lip service at that point. What's up, Zach? Um, do you like give the listing agent, this, I'm, pretty, I'm really new to this, do you give the listing agent your lender's information for your buyers? Like as soon as you're making that, um, uh, that offer so they can call them? Cause obviously they've got, 10 offers on the table or they call all the lenders like how how do you get them to have that conversation with your buyer's lender so some do some just call just to confirm um but i ask my lender to reach out i give the, my lender the listing agents okay. additionally you're going to include after your personal letter next thing excuse me 
pre-approval letter. Pre-approval letter should be on top of your purchase agreement. Your pre-approval letter is going to have your lender's information on there. So if they do want to reach out to your lender, they can do so. But I always am proactive in having mine reach out to the listing agent for me, for my buyers. Now, there's nothing saying that FHA is not a great offer. FHA, especially if it's a really nice house that's, you know, is not going to have any issues with an FHA appraisal. Again, it's up to you to really sell it. You know, I've been in this house. I noticed that, you know, this is not going to be any issue for an FHA appraisal. These, it's all just selling exactly who they are, what, what they can do and why they're in their position that they're in and why they deserve this house. Now you are going to struggle with convent with, uh, with, uh, non-conventional financing with FHA or DBA, you are going to struggle to get listing agents to believe in you in those, in those situations. So talk again, just talk it out, tell them how great they are, everything like that. And then, um, it's also an expectation setting conversation to have with your buyers at that time. So if your buyers are FHA and they're a, you know, three and a half percent down something like, or maybe they're MHFA and they're doing a thousand dollars in earnest, <clears throat> that's it. Um, listing agents are saying sometimes like, don't even bother. If it's not conventional, don't even bother weekend one. I don't want to see it. Um, which I have my own opinions about that, but that's fine. Uh, in that situation, it's kind of up to you to set expectations for your buyer in that you can say, you know, this is kind of where we're at. You have a great offer in any other market. This is a great offer, but just where we're at and where competition's at. Unfortunately, an FHA offer just doesn't seem to be as competitive as a conventional offer. What does that mean for you? Why don't we try looking at homes that maybe have a few more days on market? Honestly, after seven days on market, stuff changes. Like, so many more possibilities become available. FHA, paying under asking, all of this stuff. First week on market, it's pretty hard to, it's not impossible, but it can be harder to get a listing agent or a seller to accept your um, lower earnest money, lower percentage down offers. Um, so setting that expectation up front and saying, you know, there are great homes that may look like they're overpriced, but if it's been on the market for more than 10 days, 12 days, 30 days, whatever you want to say, there's a real opportunity that we could get your offer accepted on the first try and you could probably pay under list price. So setting it up in the light that they don't have a bad offer, but here's a great opportunity, you know, making, letting them still feel good that there is still a possibility. And there really is with FHA buyers or non-conventional buyers. Okay. Now appraisal. What's up? Oh, the appraisal. So um, if you have an offer and when you call a listing agent, would it be acceptable to say, you know, if, it, if it's FHA or DVA um, about the appraisal difference? So if it appraises at 410 and you're offering 415, would you say like my, my buyers are willing to pay that extra $5,000 difference? In FHA and VA, I'm pretty sure, I'm like 90% sure, Jelena, you might know this for sure. I'm pretty sure you can't come out of pocket to cover any appraisal differences. It has to appraise in an FHA VA situation. I believe so. Yeah. So no, unfortunately with that offer, you cannot offer an appraisal guarantee with a conventional offer. You can, and what a, an appraisal guarantee is just exactly what Azarea was saying in that in the event of a low appraisal, I can send you this language too. in the event of a low appraisal, Buyer agrees to cover any difference between purchase price and appraised value up to X. It could be up to $10,000, $15,000, whatever they feel comfortable coming out of pocket in order to, in order to, to buy that home. Does that help? What other questions can I answer about an appraisal? I know appraisal is what a lot of people get tripped up on. What about um, when people say that they're putting in appraisal clauses to protect their sellers? Um, is, is that something that can be done? So it's, that's kind of the same thing I was just saying, basically okay. that, so typically, normally, if a, if a property doesn't appraise, let's say you, your buyer offered 415,000 and it appraised at 400,000, the bank's not going to lend you that 415 because the, the bank's saying it's not worth it, right? You only get that 400,000. In a normal market, someone's got to give. It's either you got to come out of pocket, which a lot of buyers can't always do, or the seller has to lower their price 
in order for it to meet that appraised value. In this market, because it's insanity, um, even if it appraises at 400, you've offered 415, let's say you and one other offer are identical and you've both offered 415, but they have the $15,000 appraisal guarantee in there that is offering more protection to the sellers because in the event that it appraises at $400,000, the buyers are gonna come out of pocket with 15 grand to meet that purchase price. Now, you can put a blanket statement of we'll cover any difference between purchase price and appraised value. You are opening up yourself to a lot of maybes because, you know, let's say that the home is listed for 400,000, you offer 415, it appraises. I mean, this doesn't happen really honestly often these days. Properties are appraising pretty darn well. Um, but in the event that you know it's listed for 400, you pay or you offer 415, it appraises at 375. Oofta! Now they're coming out of pocket for 50 grand. That's a lot. That a lot of people and you want to make sure that your buyers completely understand everything they're signing up for in this game too. So what this means when we put this on the paper is that if the off if the uh, house appraises for 15 grand under what you offered it's up to you to come out of pocket to cover that difference. Are you comfortable doing that? And, and make sure that, because there's a, lot of, there's a lot of jargon that we use in real estate. Um, appraisal guarantee, you know, a lot of people don't even know what earnest money means. Like you wouldn't know if you weren't in this industry, you know, or you hadn't bought a home before. Um, so making sure that you're spending time with your buyers and explaining, understanding, and then also explaining fully what these varied terms mean and how they can be manipulated is huge. So again, scripting is gonna be everything with this too. Um, figuring out how to have those difficult conversations of like how, it, cause it's scary. It's scary asking people how much money they have. It's, it's uncomfy. You know, I don't really wanna know how much money you got in the bank but I wanna make sure that I'm giving you the best service possible. So here's what an option is. I'm gonna give you option A, appraisal guarantee. B, appraisal guarantee of $5,000, $10,000, whatever it might be, no appraisal guarantee at all. This is what this means for you. Where do you sit in those three options? Then let them ask questions, decide, go from there. Is that a separate document or is that something you put in the purchase agreement? That is something I put in the other section of the purchase agreement. Okay. So let me see if I can find one. I will find, oh, I still am sharing my screen with you guys, sorry. I'll find one that I have with an appraisal guarantee. Mm -hmm. Let's do, This one was madness, madness, madness. All right, you see my screen? Okay, offer. Um, let's see here. Oh, yeah, I didn't even put the appraisal guarantee on that line. What's wrong with you, Emily? So normally I would have put the appraisal guarantee in my summary. Even I, I may, I've done this hundreds of times and I still make mistakes. So this offer here, we offered a starting price of 615,000 with escalation up to 632,000. What does that mean? I'm happy to send you this language. Purchase price. So if you are doing, we're gonna start with escalation clause. We'll go back to appraisal guarantee here shortly. With an escalation clause, the, the starting price is the price that your buyer is, is comfortable paying straight out of the gate. So even if someone else was in this case, let's say someone else is offering 605, they're still are gonna offer 615 no matter what. Then there's your percentage down. Honor before, oh, this is a good one too. If you can't get a hold of the listing agent and you're not exactly sure when the seller needs to close, but your buyers are flexible, do an on or before. Honor before 45 days, honor before 60 days. And then in the, uh, like in the email here, I'm pretty sure I said, oh, seller's choice. So that's another thing. Cause I could not reach this listing agent for the life of me. I couldn't figure out when they needed to close, but I needed to get this offer in by a deadline. So we just say honor before, if we need to change it, we can totally change it. And I'm also communicating that verbally over the phone. Type of financing, written statement. 
written statement. I'm like this, I could talk about this for hours and hours. Sorry, we only have 10 minutes left. Um, your written statement is basically the statement from the lender saying that they've made all their verifications and they're ready to fund this loan for your buyers. Why is that important? Because it's, it's just important for a seller or a listing agent to know that the buyer checks out. So typically on my written, I always do a written statement. I do it either if the closing is 30 days out, I do it one week before closing. If the closing is more than 30 days out, I do a written statement one month from the date that I wrote the purchase agreement. If we want to talk about that, you need help on that. I'm also totally available anytime. Call me and we can talk through offers. I'm happy to do that. Yeah, Emily, I was just going to ask you about that. So um, as uh, a listing agent, do they prefer to see that date rather than if they don't qualify, the earnest money goes back to the buyer? Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's a better way to do that. I only do written statements. Juliana, do you do, do you do the box? Yeah. In the last six months, I've only been doing written statements unless I know there's no competition, then I'll do the other one. My, my question for you though, is uh, there's oftentimes a lot of contingencies still because they don't do verification checks till 24 hours before. Do you think that matters at all? Um, so I, both of my lenders are already uh, fully underwritten. Okay. So that's another thing you're going to want to ask your, you're going to make, going to want to make sure that your lender either is one already underwriting your buyers prior to making offers, especially in this market, um, or just making sure that you are completely on the same page with your lender. You need to make sure that like, I know my lender is backwards and forwards now because I've done this a time or two. So I, I know exactly what I can expect from them and they know what I could write and they know what I'm going to write on these lines. Um, so that that's my basically uh, arrangement with my lenders, I know that they can have me a written statement in three weeks. Um, not every lender can do that. So make sure you're double checking with your lender. If they can't do that, I would find out why and, and kind of, I don't know, maybe find a different lender, but that's a conversation for a different day. Emily, okay. I have a quick question. Can yeah. you touch really quickly again on the difference between the written statement and what that entails versus a pre-approval letter? I'm like kind of confused as to what the difference is. Sure. Pre-approval letter. So pre-approval letter is saying that based on the checks that we've done so far, they have submitted all these documents. They are conditionally approved for up to X. On this one, US Bank does an amount. I always ask for a uh, pre-approval letter without a purchase price on it. Push for that if you can do it. This one, my buyer was very particular in working with this specific lender. U.S. Bank has to put, a lot of banks have to put a number on the line. Wells Fargo, U.S. Bank, whatever. Also, there's a huge benefit in working with a mortgage broker versus a bank. So many topics I could cover here. Um, mortgage brokers can bend a lot more rules than banks can. So they're typically going to look a little bit better. Um, probably gonna work a little bit better for you in terms of hours, availability, conversation wise, things like that. Also might be better to work with in terms of getting things done on time. There's not as many checks and balances to go through on the mortgage side as there is with banks. There's just so many more moving parts with the bank. Um, but so that's basically saying that we've done our checks and balances on the front end, check their income, their uh, tax statements, things like that. We're based on what we have right now, we know that they are approved for X amount. They're ready to buy this house pre-approved. Then after we have an offer accepted, the lender is going to basically do those checks again, make sure that they're still employed, make sure that they have all up-to-date payment or pay stubs, um, things like that. Basically just confirming that everything that they set up front is still legit. It is still true. And they are still ready. They are still able to buy this house. So a written statement is a commitment to lend basically. So they're saying that after I have checked box A, B, and C, whatever it is, this we're committing to fund this loan at that point. So there's still basically a pre-approval is saying like, this is all good. If all of this is still true on the date of closing, then they are pre-approved for this amount. Written statement is we have double checked that they said everything that upfront is true. We're going to fund it. So it's just proof that that's all good to go. Does that make sense? Yep, totally. Thank you. Next, okay, where did we stop? Type of financing. Then closing costs, closing costs. 
might be the death of some of your buyers, unfortunately. Um, closing costs tend to be about 3% of the purchase price. That's what I typically um, tell my buyers. If your seller, if your buyer needs closing costs covered, you can add that on top of your offer. So what does that mean? They don't have a lot of cash on hand. One, I would recommend them using a down payment assistance program um, that might help cover those closing costs for them in the event that that's not possible and they need closing costs covered, they cannot come out of pocket. Let's say we're writing an offer for a home that's $200,000. If we're asking the seller to pay 3% in closing costs, you can reduce the seller's proceeds by that 3%. So that's if we checked is and on box number 161, we put 3%. That would mean that the sellers walk away with $194,000 because they've contributed about $6,000 to, this, to the buyer's closing costs. Closing costs are lender fees, title fees, state and county recording fees, um, escrowing for property taxes and insurance, things like that. Not everybody has that in, in hand. If they don't have it and you still wanna make a full price offer, you want the seller to net $200,000 still, what you would do is you would write an offer for $206,000, asking the seller to contribute 3% in closing costs, so basically that reduces their proceeds by that $6,000, meaning they still walk away with 200,000, even though you offered 206. Does that make sense? That closing costs can be a trick. Once you get it, you get it, but it, it can take a minute. Um, in this market, I mean, you really want your buyers paying their own closing costs. That's gonna be the most competitive every single time. Inspections. Inspection, uh, this is another one that can be really touchy with your buyers and you don't, you wanna make sure that you're not opening yourself up for liability. Inspections are optional, we recommend them. I recommend them because I wanna make sure you know exactly what you're getting yourself into when you purchase this home. That said, this is a market in which a lot of buyers are waiving their inspections. What does that mean? It means either you can do a few, one of a few things. You can make it non-contingent upon an inspection. That means that there's no inspection period. It goes from active straight to pending. You have nobody to come in and check out the house. No renegotiations happen. Another option is a peace of mind inspection. With a peace of mind inspection, so, okay, so for waiving your inspection, line 170, you would hit decline. Line 172, you would say is not. And line 179 is not or does not, 185. And then you, I would usually put NA there. In the event that my buyer wants a peace of mind inspection only, that means that they're gonna have an inspection done on the property. They have the opportunity to cancel if they so choose, but they're not gonna use the inspection period to renegotiate any price or terms. So that's what this one is here. So buyer elects to have an inspection, this purchase agreement, purchase agreement is contingent upon that inspection. I always select does not allow intrusive testing because we don't really do much lead testing on, on my end. Um, this one we did three, so here's my language. So buyer to perform a home inspection for peace of mind only. Buyer will not use the inspection period to renegotiate price or terms. And we changed that to three business days because I don't know if we had something going on, but um, this is typically calendar days. So in day one starts the day after you have it accepted. Okay, another option for a peace of mind inspection. So buyer elects, you can have a peace of mind inspection, buyer elects to have a property inspection completed. Purchase agreement is not contingent upon the inspection. What does that mean? We're gonna have an inspection, but we cannot cancel. So what this 172 is saying right here is basically whether or not the buyer has the right to cancel after an inspection. This is a huge box. This is extremely important to clarify with your buyers. If we're doing a peace of mind inspection, do you want the opportunity to be able to walk away? Or do you want a peace of mind inspection and, and you have to move forward no matter what? Conversation around this is going to be key because um, depending on what price point you're at too, typically the sellers are going to disclose the bigger ticket items. They're gonna, hopefully we're gonna know what the age of the roof is. If you are at the property, get good at, get it good at checking windows and get good at um, finding out the age of the mechanicals. Those are gonna be the biggest things. I'll get to you in a second, Zach. Um, to, those are gonna be the biggest things to find out straight out of the gate and then ask your buyers, you know, 
typically the home inspection is telling us exactly what's wrong with the property. Every single home comes with things that are wrong. You know, not, no home, even brand new construction isn't perfect. Now, the things that we find, you're going to spend about a thousand bucks, give or take on an inspection all in. Um, the things that we might find might add up to $2,000, $3,000, $4,000. There's always a chance that bigger things happen, but there's a 100% chance that something's going to come up in, in the inspection. Is that amount of money, is it whether it's $2,000, $3,000, $4,000 on whatever the fixes might be, is it worth giving up this house for that? Because yeah, we might have the opportunity to negotiate with the seller and get them to you know, clean out the sewer line, spend a couple hundred bucks on that. But if somebody else didn't ask him to spend that couple hundred bucks, that might look better. Is it really worth, you know, giving, giving this up for that couple hundred bucks? And you can kind of talk through that scenario in a few different ways. What's up, Zach? Maybe I missed the, the phrasing on this, but when you're um, doing a peace of mind inspection, do, would you say still elects or do you, would you say declines and then make that clarification in that additional section? If you are having an inspection, you say elects. So even if it's just peace in mind, it's still at the buyer's expense, the expense is just zero in this case, since it's basically just the buyer walking through? Um, no, so you can have a regular home inspection. It has nothing to so do I'm with saying, it. No, I'm saying if they just want to do the peace of mind, that's what I was saying. Yep, so peace of mind is basically just saying that we are not going to use the inspection period to renegotiate price or terms. So that is saying that whatever terms we put on this paper day one is what's going to go to closing. We're going to have an inspection just so we know what we're getting ourselves into. We will not use the, the results of the inspection to change the terms of this offer. Got it. Okay. Got it. So Emily, I guess my question for you is um, what is the difference then between having a three day inspection contingency and just decline just saying on line 172 that it's not contingent upon the findings of the inspection so a lot of buyers just want to know they want to know i guess okay wait ask your question one more time yeah so whether they're doing a peace of mind inspection or <clears throat> they're just saying that the offer is not contingent about upon an inspection this, the buyer is still wanting to elect to do an inspection. So what's the difference between saying um, they elect to do the inspection, it is contingent and there's a three day um, inspection contingency as opposed to electing to do the inspection and it's not contingent upon, what's, what's the difference there? Ability why, why to do the peace of mind. Ability to cancel. So, okay, so it's a pass or fail basically is what yep. you're saying. Okay. Yep. And I mean, it's, it's completely elective, right? Like it's not up to me, it's not up to the inspector, it's up to the buyer, whether or not they're comfortable moving forward with based on the results of the inspection. But if you okay. select is not contingent upon, they are, they move to pending straight away. They do not have the opportunity to back out of that purchase agreement and keep their earnest money. Gotcha, okay. Okay. Um, other inspection terms, peace of mind and other in inspection terms. Sorry, I'll let you guys go. And you're obviously welcome to hop off as you got to go. I can be done here shortly. Um, anything about the inspection, you put in other inspection items. Sale of buyer's property contingency, I'm sure you've probably heard. Non-contingent is king again right now. You can go into that separately. Feel free to reach out to me. This stuff's pretty normal. Again, happy to go through that if need be. Let's see here. Other. Oh, this part, this is your uh, escalation clause. So you put the initial offer. So here, what did I say here? I said purchase price $615,000 with escalation up to $632,000. What that looks like in language, and I can send this to you. You don't feel like you have to copy it down word for word. For word. You can even find it online if you just Google it. You can find something about it. But what mine says is, Purchase price to be a minimum of $615,000. Should another offer be presented that is a higher net price to the seller, buyer will pay $2,000. This number can change right here, whether it's $5,000, $1,000, depending on where you're at, what your buyers can do or want to do. Buyer will pay X amount higher than that offer, not to exceed X. How do I find out what that X price is, that top, top, top price that my buyers are willing to go? The question is, how did we land on 632 of all things? Oh. 
I typically try to land on not a five or a zero because I think a lot of people land on five or zero. Um, so if they're comfortable with 630, I'm going to ask, okay, and a good rule of thumb is every thousand dollars in an offer is basically five about five dollars on your monthly payment. So you know if somebody else is offering six hundred thirty thousand dollars, would you feel comfortable paying ten dollars more a month to win that house? People usually in that case say yeah. Um, so that's how we got up to six hundred thirty two thousand. If somebody else were willing to pay six hundred thirty three thousand, would you be sad that you lost that house? In this case, they said no. No. If somebody really wants to pay that for this house, let them have it. So I keep asking my buyers that question up until a point where I get that no. So that I'm not pushing them straight out of the gate. This also ensures, an escalation clause ensures that they are not overpaying for the home. They are only paying $2,000 higher than the next best offer. Not all listing agents allow escalation clauses. That is another thing you're gonna to wanna to ask up front. Do you accept an escalation clause? Some people are gonna be like, no, it's an old school kind of seller, just put your best foot forward. Then it's up to you to ask the right questions. The escalation clause can be kind of a, a lifesaver if you need it um, in terms of just not making them overpay, but it's not something that's gonna be on the table all the time. Uh, so you have to also know how to ask those right questions. That is pretty much it for those two um, language things. Sorry for going over. Like I said, I could talk about this all day long. Is there any other questions I can answer for you before I let y'all go? Could I ask a quick one? Yeah. Um, how many transactions have you been involved with where the escrow money uh, was retained by the seller and the deal did not go through? Handful. Okay, cool. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to take my info in the chat for you to reach out if you have any other questions. Emily, this was so helpful. Thank you so much. Oh, good. I feel like I was like running around like chicken with my head cut off. So I'm glad you got some value. It's like at first, I always come to these. I'm like, how am I going to fill an hour with just this? And then you get to talking about it. It's easy. Um, Emily, can I ask you one question? Please. Quick, before you go. You started to give the order of offer. You did order summary, personal letter, and then you got distracted. I'll type it for you. You know, I'll copy and paste it. I do personal property. I don't know if you guys do personal property, but I like to include it. Mm -hmm. Oops, any. So at that point, I mean, property disclosure, your arbitration disclosure, meh. It's not the biggest deal it's in order lead based paint disclosure would go at the end um because that's going to be again everything uniform so every every buyer is going to sign the disclosures right or mm -hmm. likely going to sign all the disclosures so that's not going to differentiate you from bill what is going to differentiate you is who you're working with on the lending side your pre-approval letter they need to know straight out of the gate whether or not they can purchase this home your purchase agreement obviously has all the terms on it that you need in order to get this offer accepted. The rest of it is more just house cleaning stuff from there. Okay. Thank you. All right, friends, reach out to me anytime. Text. I'm better. I'm better at texting than anything else, but you can email me too. I might get to it in a couple weeks. Perfect. Thank you, Emily. I appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for your time. Yeah. Have a good day, everyone. Yeah. Nice Thanks to meet you guys. So much. Bye. And Emily, this is, oh, she's gone. <laughs> <laughs> What were you going to say, Wendy? I was going to tell her it's recorded. So um hope she's okay with that. <laughs> I'll follow up with her. Bye. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Wendy.